Hello, and welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. My name is Fred Valles. I'm your host. I'm also the co-founder of Optimizer. So uh, we were back with an episode here, and we've got one favorite speaker, Kirk Williams, and we got a brand new first-time speaker, uh, not exactly new to the PPC industry, but first-timer on PPC Town Hall, Sam Tomlinson. So uh, very excited to talk to both of them. And the topic we're going to discuss is about integrated search. So usually we talk a lot about PPC here, you know, keywords, targeting, all of that good stuff, bid management. Uh, but today we brought in Sam and we also want to broaden the conversation a little bit and talk about integrated search and what that really means. Because at the end of the day, we do have a whole page of search results and the ads are just a small portion of that. Kirk is our specialist on shopping ads, so he'll be able to discuss that portion. I know a lot about the ads, so I can help with that. But then Sam is, uh, is he takes the broader view and is going to help us understand what integrated search means, why it's important, how we convince the C-suite to implement it. And we're also going to get tactical and give you some specific advice and strategies for how you can bring all three of these things together. We're also just past uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, so we're certainly going to talk about that. But uh, I'm looking forward to doing this episode, so uh, let's get rolling with PPC Town Hall. All right, welcome to my guests. Uh, Kirk, you're in the middle here, so uh, let's say hello to you first. Nice to have you back. How are things going? Thank you. It's good to be back. I uh, I was humming along with your music, and then I realized I hope I'm on mute, and I was. But <laughs> that would have been a special treat. I think that is. I'm a good. Feat. Thank you. They now mute us. Um, Kirk, congratulations! Uh, you're back on the top 25 PPC influencers list for the uh, umpteenth time. Um, that list came out yesterday, so anyone who hasn't seen it, go to the PPC Hero blog and check that out. Sam, uh, first time on PPC Town Hall. Great to have you. Um, so our viewers may not know you quite as well. So uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. So first, thanks for having me, Fred. Really appreciate it. Always great to meet some new people, be on new things. So I'm Sam Tomlinson. I'm the executive vice president at Warshawski. We're a boutique digital communications agency based in Baltimore with offices in New York and DC. I'm also on the faculty at Johns Hopkins and Georgetown. So I teach classes on digital marketing strategy, uh, social advertising, and then for Georgetown, I'm doing a really cool full life cycle uh, direct-to-consumer marketing course, which is really fun to actually explore the whole business side of it, not just do marketing. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Nice. Uh, other okay. than that, and I'm a um, partner in our venture capital fund. So I also do marketing and then I invest stuff. I used to be in finance, so kind of moving like all the things I used to do together into one weird blob of stuff. Doesn't sound like you're a busy man at all. Not much going on. <laughs> no. And then I find time on Twitter to yell about the flyers. All the flyers. <laughs> yeah, but you get some basketballs in the background. Uh... Oh, yeah. No, I played uh, juniors hockey and basketball. So, yeah. Those Have you are ever played sports. basketball with anyone famous? <laughs> <laughs> a few people. Just a few characters. <laughs> All right, let's, let's not mention the names here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're joking. Sam has played with some NBA players, so that's what we're joking. Yeah, we're that's about fine. That. So, yeah, yeah, you pick up games for charity. Well, and, you're and I should, I, I will, I'll shout out Sam a little bit. So, Sam is definitely like a go to that I enjoy chatting with to hear his finance takes. Um, on Twitter, he's taught me a lot, but he spoke at HeroConf few years back and like one of my team members has always remembered your session it's one of those standout sessions for them and i think was it on like a money ball type oh, the money ball thing? talk yeah the i money love ball that talk. talk he he loved it as well so there you go you you made an indelible impression i try yes. plus i just think the money ball is awesome and fascinating but highly rated sessions at hero conf so uh and sam i think you're going to be back there in yes in that, i'll right? be back Yep, I'll be back at HeroComp. Where are we doing it? Austin, maybe? Austin. Somewhere in Texas? Austin. Yeah, I'm doing a session on audience structure, on combined audience structures for search advertising. Yeah. Combined audience structures. Well, that's not the topic of today, but I am curious no. what does that mean in like 
a few sentences? Oh, so it's talking about the different ways you can use the combined audiences feature within Google Ads for PPC to kind of use audiences as a secondary or even a primary targeting lever. And if you use the combined targeting features, like what are the best ones to use? What can you do with them? Very cool. Uh, Kirk, yeah. are you going to be awesome? Yeah, I'll be, okay. I'll be shifting from my normal talks on like shopping and e-com and that, like shifting dramatically and uh, speaking on like, basically a kind of a clickbaity title, like stop scaling, bring you like building the PPC agency you actually want to work at type of deal. And so just talking through like how I think about how we bring on clients, how we partner with certain individuals, how we look at shooting for profitability and things like that. And a lot of that tends to go with kind of the opposite of a sheer extreme growth mentality where you moving, you're moving as fast as you can and growing your agency just so you can sell it. Right. So almost more like a lifestyle type agency, how to think about that. And I personally think we need a lot more of that because then it allows us to focus better on serving our employees well, serving our clients well, as opposed to just like growing our agency. So that'll be my talk. All right. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's kind of the same way we think about a uh, optimizer. It's about that longevity and, you know, if we sold it to someone, then, you know, God knows what they do with it. <laughs> and customers are still served well. Uh, plus, we're having fun doing this, right? So, mm -hmm. so long as we're not stressing ourselves out too much, let's keep doing this and everybody's happier. Um, plus, then you got the dude dad hat going on. So <laughs> as a family man, I get it. You want to have a good work-life balance. Hey, yeah, I see exactly. everyone's already figured out how to do the, uh, the commenting. So uh, thanks for doing that. Tell us where you're calling in from use that to ask questions and steer the conversation. Um, and Kirk, at some point today, I want to take a look at your Legos because it seems like you still have that unhealthy obsession with Legos. Um, but let's get, into Absolutely. The, let's get into the topic here. So integrated search. Um, Sam, tell us a little bit what this is and, and why it's something you think about. Sure. So I started thinking about this maybe like 2015, 2016. And it ironically was like my wife that kind of got me thinking about this because she knows that I work a lot in the digital advertising space and she's, you know, looking and searching and she's like, okay, so which one of these things do you do? And she like, show me a search page. She's like, okay, wh what did you do here? And I'm like, well, I did the ads, obviously. She's like, well, I don't know what the ads are. I'm like, okay, that's weird, but you're probably right. And I started thinking more and like, it just like stuck in my head for forever. I'm thinking about this, like, well, we mostly do a lot of PPC. We do, uh, we do some SEO when we have an SEO team and they're great, but like we primarily do PPC and we work with SEO agencies for clients and we try to make things work. But I kept going back to this thought of like, and she's like, but she didn't know which one I did. Like, this is infuriating to me. Like, we're not thinking about this holistically. We're doing the ads at the top or the bottom of the page, or, you know, as Google has introduced new features, we're doing, you know, maybe some shopping ads that are in a carousel and a SERP feature. But the user doesn't know that. And I'm thinking to myself, so we're solving one part of this equation, right? We're solving the PPC part. We're trying to solve it really, really well. And the SEO agency is thinking about solving the SEO part of this, the, the 10 blue links, the SERP features sometimes, maybe if they're good, sometimes. But none of us are solving the whole picture, which is the only thing that actually matters, which is what the consumer sees. Like, why should my ad should be complementary to what my blue link is if I have one? You know, I should be taking the insights from the SEO agency and using them for PPC. I should be taking the insights that we can get as a PPC -er on what terms perform and passing those to the SEO agency so they're not wasting their time and spending their wheels thinking about what to rank for. And we should probably all be working with the shopping agency if they have one because God only knows, you know, for a branded search, for instance, do I, is it good for me to have a PPC ad there if we have a shopping ad? Like, which one of these makes more sense? Which one makes the customer more money? And I, to me, it just became like this thing, like, why aren't we solving, why aren't we approaching search results pages the way that a user does? And that's how I came up with this whole idea of like, okay, integrated search. Like we need to think about how we make everybody work together better. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to hear how you put that into practice. And Kirk, I'd love to hear too. Um, you know, when you think about integrating search with shopping and shopping, not really having keywords um, and an SEO and PPC or you know, the traditional text ads, you do have keywords. How you bridge that gap, right? How do you move findings from one channel to another when you don't necessarily have access 
to the same targeting methods. Uh, so Kirk, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, let me let me start kind of big picture. Um, I think this is where, like really starting from the beginning, this is where partnering well with your agencies and finding the right agencies is going to be absolutely crucial. And like that's not just a throwaway statement. It's 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 kind of bizarre to me when I when I hear of and see um, businesses who put like less energy into hiring an agency than they do maybe their own employees, like their process and that. And like the reason why it's so crucial is like what Sam just described is fairly common. You 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 often have a different SEO, a different SEM agency working together, and like finding agencies who actually are more interested in, and they're capable of thinking through, thinking about it strategically, reporting in that on like whole business growth and and kind of thinking holistically about you and how they can help you, and not just like what they're trying to do with their specific channel. Is just really, really crucial. That also goes into the goals that you're going to give them and, and how you communicate with them, right? If, if you're just, if like we've had it happen before where we have an account a client where things are really, really going well, and yet for whatever reason, there might be specific channels in that that um, appear to be underperforming. Some of that might be just because they're top of funnel. They're they're starting the the customer buying journey. Um, and, and like, there's almost this obsession with like, whoa, whoa, everything's working well. Why isn't this? And we'll, we'll talk through that. How, how do we think through that? And yet to me, the, the bigger picture is like, how are you communicating and, and holding them to it? And are you kind of forcing agencies to think more, more siloed or are you all working together in kind of this rising tide lifts all boats type way? Um, and, and I think that's really how, how, as you start that relationship, your SEO, PPC agency to begin with, just for things to work well and to get into the practical tips, we will like, you, they've got to be on good terms and everyone thinking about, about you, you know, growing in that. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of a bigger picture thought on, on shopping specifically. I'll, I'll throw out, you know, one thought is it, along those lines, like we see shopping ads as what it is a comparison shopping engine so it's a cse you have you have a lot of comparing going on you have a lot of you have a lot of people who might open up a bunch of products that they're interested in into multiple tabs um they might click through that they might check out the price they might i mean they can see the price but you know they might want to get to the you know the description what else can we learn about this product right close it out so like we typically see conversion rate for shopping um uh, quite a bit lower than 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 e like our search and that which is normal to me. More people are clicking; they're looking around. To to me, how thinking about that in, in, in integrated search is really important because as you're thinking of shopping, there almost needs to be this initial stop of realizing, like shopping has a role, and a lot of the role that shopping has, especially with organic, and then especially with like more more bottom funnel search brand, all that stuff is shopping is really good at starting a lot of that stuff um, and thinking through that. And so I, th I think that's initially like how we need to think about how search organic and shopping work together um, specifically as, as shopping comes around. So those are kind of some big picture thoughts. And Sam, how do you approach that conversation uh, with the, the management, the decision makers? How do you go about setting goals with them that are reasonable and that account for had the three factors? Yeah, so I think it's a lot of times when we are talking with executives, they often don't know. I think that's probably been a marketer's fault. Like most executives, like they get reports with with clicks and with impressions and they just don't care. Um, like I used to be one of those people. So I would like get this report when I think the one with the news means. So you don't care until it all breaks, right? And then you're like, okay, now I need to know why is there fewer clicks? Yeah, exactly. Out? Like then something's wrong shows up and you get very angry. But right, but I think we start with understanding, like Kurt said, like what is the actual objective you're trying to reach here? What is the, you know, let's understand this and then let's back out from that and go from okay, you need to you need to achieve X goal. We need to sell this many units at this price or less. We need to fill this many rooms in our hotel for this season. We need to to lease this many units. I need to sell this many cars, whatever, who cares? What's it's interesting, and sorry to interrupt, but what's interesting is that you're really talking about top level business goals. Um, but sometimes then I, I guess you work with the team that's doing digital marketing and they have sort of a, a set of goals that's that should be complementary to what the whole company is trying to do, but they all start competing for that same pie. 
all the time. So yeah, hundred percent. But I think so. I I think in cases where the the digital marketing team is diverging from from the CEO team, to me that's not a healthy relationship, and it's not one that we really want to be involved with. So either we work with them to get it back in line, so that you're not competing with this budget. Or it's not something that I think we're going to be successful at. Like if you're trying to constantly defend your budget and optimize towards some set of goals that ultimately a CEO is not going to care about or a CFO is not going to care about, I don't think that's going to be healthy or sustainable for us long term. Because eventually somebody's going to pay attention and say, like, what were you doing over here? Like, we told you this. So I think when especially when we're talking to C level decision makers, I want to understand like what their vision is for the like what they want to achieve and then work with our marketing contacts, our whatever, our client contact to then take those big picture roles that they have and bring them into into line with what we're doing or with what their other partners are doing if we're working together. Because at the end of the day, I think if we're all not rowing in the same direction, it's just not going to work. So yeah, it's big picture business goals. But I think in case where the, disagreement uh, goes, you go to the top. Right. And so in the Warshowski agency, um, your agency, is that easier because you do touch on sort of all of those areas and, and you have easier access to the, the C-suite? Um, have you had situations where they just hire you for one thing and then it becomes more complicated? Yes. Um, so in general, yeah. Um, we have had cases where we've been hired for one very specific thing like PPC and then it ends up getting more complicated. And I'm okay with complicated. I'm not okay with conflicting. So uh, in cases where we have had that, usually what we ask for is a, a chance to sit down with everybody. The other agency partners, we work very well. We'd like to support them. We want them to do their best work because that um, and the senior leadership. And we try to get everybody together either for a, a strategy and planning meeting, a kickoff meeting, whatever you call it, and actually really get into understanding who is responsible for what. Because I feel like in the cases where we've been brought in to do a specific task, like, I mean, Kurt, you mentioned this already. There's just so much overlap between what we're all doing. If we're not clear about who's responsible for what and who's solving for what and what we're all ultimately working towards, I feel like people just end up trying to create like these little fiefdoms inside the marketing team. And that's not helpful or productive because you want to protect your little piece of business versus helping the client grow the overall business. And we've been in those cases. And it's not definitely helpful. having. Sorry. Yeah. I was going to say definitely having someone client side who like probably part of their job is overseeing that is overseeing communication between those different departments. And I mean, that's whether you have in-house teams or agencies or whatever, right? You, you still have unique people who likely are doing this unless you're really small, you're paid media manager, like actual account, the one pushing the buttons probably isn't the one also doing SEO type stuff. You know, that happens when people are really, really small even then. Um, so, so having someone who kind of is in charge of all of that is, is I think really, really important client side. Um, another thing just kind of on the goal side uh, that we've found is like overall, I think I've started to see a shift in this in e-commerce at least as, uh, as people are discussing this online, I'm seeing this and also what we're seeing in our clients and that. And I think that as you think of like how to make different channels work together, how, to, how even to identify like what's working, what's not. Um, the more you can shift away from having like your single beloved source of truth be like click attribution ROAS um, or, you know, some sort of click attribution single channel, this is your goal. And, and, and again, I'm saying big picture, highest objective. And those those shops that seem to start to shift to more of like a, a MER media efficiency ratio um, type of a, of a system where what they're doing is, it, again, like a, a rising tide lifts all boats. All right. Um, I really think that is the best analogy for this sort of thing is you're looking at here's overall top line what we're doing. Here's overall what we're spending. And then there are like softer goals individually that that each maybe each of the channels are are hitting but i say softer because like they can be flex like stuff changes whoa what happened you know black friday cyber monday a little bit different this year for paid media in terms of cpcs and actual spend like how should we think about that and one of the hugest benefits that i've seen in even the relationship between the different channel partners and and the clients is 
having a better vision of big picture revenue versus big picture spend and then thinking through that is is like you you tend to start getting less of this focus on whoa this was the hard revenue and 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 profit goal that efficiency goal that we had for you you didn't hit it this year so like what happened and give me six reasons why that didn't happen and like why you need to fix it and there's a better understanding of, of again kind of that bigger picture that the client has that I think also relieves some of that both pressure and even some of that that turf ness that can happen because again everyone is working together for this same goal and not just like trying to hit your 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 profit your ROAS in that which it can even can even lead to bad agency behaviors frankly like if if an agency who is unethical is totally focused on hitting you know this amount of revenue in ROAS like it's going to be a harder sell for them to not really try to as much as possible lean into bottom funnel stuff, brand remarketing, stuff like that, because that's what makes them individually look good as opposed to really thinking outside the box. How can we find these sources of, of, of upper funnel and really build the brand? Um, so I just think that's really important for goal measuring. Yeah. And this is kind of a related question from the audience here, but, uh, um, Karen from Ecuador, thanks for asking. Uh, but what is the importance of data-driven attribution models in Google Ads? And so talk a little bit about going beyond the single click, um, cross-channel even, but like, like why would you want to use data-driven? Well, I think it probably, I mean, broad statement might not be true for everybody. Your mileage may vary. It all depends in people's yes. But I think... We all know that last click is pretty flawed and we all know that people are pretty complicated and we all know that customer journeys aren't one click nor should they be defined by one click. So I think using something like a data-driven attribution model helps to smooth that out and give you a more accurate read on all the channels that are contributing. It tends to push credit a little bit higher in the funnel or the journey or the maze, whatever analogy you prefer, right? Because it does take a little bit off of that last click that branded search term, well, how they how they know what to search. They have, they have to see something before about your brand in order to search for the branded search term. So the branded search term really shouldn't get all the credit just because logic. So I think data-driven attribution does help to, I think, more appropriately allocate credit across the different contributing channels and also helps to avoid the situation like Kurt described where Agencies are leaning so hard into uh, the, the bottom of the funnel, the remarketing, the branded search, because that's what drives last click attribution numbers through the roof. And they're actually, you know, con showing what contributes. So, it, yeah, obviously it's not perfect, but I think it's, a, it's better than last click and it's probably better than first click and your mileage may vary. Exactly. We're seeing one of the comments here. Lumen prefers to use first click because DDA gives too much credit to the brand. Um, it's interesting too. I mean, like how you how do you end up figuring that out when data driven is just such like kind of a black box uh, with machine learning? Okay, but Kirk, you were gonna weigh in. I was just gonna throw a completely shameless plug that um, our podcast. We're actually like I'm I'm finishing. We put like dozens of hours of editing and. I'm hoping to release it literally this week and it's on attribution where we actually like try to dig into some of that stuff. So we have two episodes coming out. The first is on like, what are some challenges with attribution? And then the second one really like we are trying to go into unique models with different guests and that to, to try to think through like, here's some specific pros and cons of, of those. One, one thing that I'll just note um, so I don't just like shameless plug and not provide any value at all would be like, again, one thing to, to be aware of with, with DDA is I, I think exactly what Sam said, like sometimes the tools that you have are better than like the tools you don't have. Right. And so like, that's, that's fine. Like those are the tools we have. That's what we use for our bidding algorithms. That's what we use for reporting. I think probably um, for the most part, because it's using, you know, algorithms, DDA probably is going to be the best shot at getting a little bit more into what an actual customer's buying journey is just because they're utilizing a lot more data than, than we have access to because any model is like literally just forcing something into the specific how it's going to dole out at, at you know credit so um so 
like every model has its its pros and cons. DDA at least has some sort of machine learning. The the one thing I'll note is that DDA is still like limited to utilizing like Google's channel, right? And and like that that also should be just we should be aware of it and be a little concerned and just at least be aware of that and how we're thinking is that DDA is still focused within within Google's realm and its own data and that, and it's, it's not utilizing all of your other sources and channels and that either um, that, that you'll see come through. So. Yeah. I think that's a question where you have to go and say, like, if you're trying to solve a holistic problem, then using any one channel, Google, Facebook, TikTok, I don't care, pick one is going to give you an incomplete picture. And that's where, you know, you have the top level stuff like Kurt talked about, like with Mer, right. But then you also have the opportunity to create, and there are, I'll give Facebook credit for this. Like I bash them a lot, but they actually did publish all of their automated marketing mix modeling code on Git. It's fantastic. It really truly is a good product. Like I spent a ton of hours playing around with Robin and it is awesome. So if you want something that's going to help you pull together all these different data sources and give you a, a different picture where you can own that, then the place for that is an attribution. The place for that is like a marketing mix model. Like that's the whole job of that. So I think look at attribution for what it is, which is a way to dole out credit to different contributing channels in an imperfect world and in really incomplete way. And look at a marketing mix model as what it is, which is a truer owned direction of where your marketing is going and, and what it's and what's contributing the most and the least. Talk a little bit more about going on GitHub. Like technically what should someone be able to do or what kind of resources do you need to to deploy um, you using Facebook? It's helpful if you know Python. Um, but so Facebook did publish, it's available on their website. If you just search Facebook Robin, it's R-O-B-Y-N. It gives you this whole library of code that's available. You can then pull that onto your machine. You can use Python, you can use whatever, it works best on Python. But whatever, you can then pull in all of your different data sources. You can link it up if you have a, a data lake and start to use this to run analyses on different time series data. So if you've got your Google spend and your Google performance over a certain period of time, your website data, you can pull that in. If you've got Facebook data, you can pull that in and it will give you basically an automated marketing mix model. So as you start to ingest more and more data, you can ingest ad units and ad sizes, which is super cool. Um, you can ingest and characterize different ad types differently, which is also a differentiator. So like without getting into the really technical portions of how you do that, if you're not sure, like go find a data science student and they can do this. It's very simple. Like that's my, my shameless plug for university students is like you can go find a graduate student in data science and you can pay them $20 an hour and they can build this for you because Facebook's documentation is that good. And as long as you're like reasonably competent at granting them access to stuff, they can give you a decent model. So support your local college students, please. That's a great plug. So um, granting access to stuff. So I let's talk about Kirk's situation, right? So Kirk is a little bit more focused on one area of digital marketing. Um, in your situation, how do you go, like, do you even want to prove to people that there's incrementality value of your channel or or does it sometimes make more sense to say, hey, look at how great shopping is as a last click attribution model. And if you want to go beyond that, like how do you how do you talk to the executives to convince them, hey, give me access to your SEO data, give me access to social, even when you haven't asked me to manage that? Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a selfish reason and an unselfish reason to um, definitely to want to see the data as it is in terms of proving true incrementality and all that. The unselfish reason would just be like, you know, and I think this is at the core of all good, good in-house marketers, freelancers, agencies, like a good one. They actually do. They actually care about what they're trying to do, which is to do well by your business and help you grow. Right. And so, um, like hiring the right people, they're going to want to see you grow. And so in some ways, like, yeah, I care about incrementality just because like, I don't like, that's just kind of the right way to do it. That's the unselfish reason, which is there. The selfish reason too, that I think sometimes people miss is like the reason why like getting to the truth of the matter is important because if I'm trying to do my job correctly, 
um, there's going to be good times and bad times in terms of like a natural ebb and flow of what's happening and like, like trying to work together to really see how as a channel, you know, helping another channel and helping the business, what it does is it actually relieves some pressure from you, honestly, because if, if, if what you're trying to do in terms of how you've built the campaigns and thought through this and you've talked through and your strategy is clear and that's how you got hired and you, you're working with your client well in terms of this is what we're trying to do, when all of a sudden there's like, wow, there's a week where it's on the struggle bus, um, I, I just I just think that you'll you'll typically have clients less like concerned and putting that pressure on you in terms of hey why is my channel down this week what what can you go do go go push something go make it right um, and even if maybe they they are talking like that it, it allows you to stick to the narrative which always has been which is hey here's here's what we're employing here's the strategy here's how we're looking at things right um, and you can and you can stick to that and kind of maintain that. And so I think in some ways, like it actually, yeah, like, like trying to go for it, like, what is your channel actually contributing to the business? Like, let, let, you know, that's the incrementality question in one sense, not just what you see, but, but what would have, what would it have contributed if, if that channel wasn't there? Um, finding that is more important than like, let's grab all of the credit we can. Um, one, one thought that I have in terms of shopping let's just say with some of these other things like organic, even, even like top, top level, but even thinking specifically about organic. Um, I, I think that you're, you're oftentimes going to see a lot of, a lot of purchases are naturally going to happen in your, your bottom funnel paid search brand remarketing, maybe even some like much lower funnel, uh, you know, non-brand terms, which is fine. You're going to see a, a lot of those sales come through in terms of organic as well, um, especially in brand. And then, you know, email, right? You have some of those. And so one of the things that I think you can do in terms of, let's just say, testing on the shopping side um, would be like like trying to get some level of of um, like how how is incrementality happening? And some of the ways maybe you could test that is by choosing specific products or category to to drop out. Uh, for a bit and try to, you know, measure overall impact on sales for like those specific products. You know, there, I'm sure other people have done other incrementality testing as well, like specifically with shopping ads for that. But uh, maybe a specific manufacturer that you, you try, if you sell a lot of shoe brands, maybe, maybe you do try um, by getting buy-in on dropping Nike from your product feed and seeing like what sort of sales uh, overall change has there been? You could even kind of see that through, again, like organic as well, specific channels. Um, so I think that's probably one way that you could look at testing that and seeing that relationship with with your clients. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are others as well, but finding out that relationship, I think really is important. And Sam, how do you guys go about looking at incrementality and proving the value of the investment uh, your client makes in each channel? So we look at this, I mean, for the for most clients, we look at this holistically, right? We're, we're looking at, and we often do, we have data science people um, who will actually build the automated marketing mix model and work with the clients to put their data in and show which spends most significantly correlate or don't correlate with increases in top line revenue and then bottom line profitability. I mean, the joke always goes like I could increase anybody's top line, but if I can't increase the bottom line, then that's kind of like, what's the point? I mean, you you know, know, anybody... the, 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 there's sort of that whole discussion now of going from ROAS to POAS. Yeah, I would love that because I did a whole talk on profit per click like four years ago. People thought I was a crazy person. So I'm really happy to hear that this, that I'm maybe still a crazy person, but a crazy person that was right. Because that's cool. I can and be I like the crazy guy. Was, uh, it's hard to measure, right? And I think that's what it's, a lot it's of infuriating. But I think if you're going to measure ROAS, you can measure profit, right? At the end of the day, it's, but it's, it, it involves asking more questions and getting comfortable with balance sheets and doing lots of things that marketers have been historically really uncomfortable doing. Because you have to then start to think about, okay, well, it's not just my ad spent and my revenue, right? There's other costs that go into selling this thing. There's costs in fulfilling it. Like, how do I really 
provide reporting that that tells the client, okay, based on all of your numbers, this is what I can actually spend. And Amazon, I think to its credit, has actually maybe helped some marketers get better at this with their advertising costs of sales and how they actually show everything on their platform. But we have to get that approach to everywhere else because Amazon is like a tiny little, well, maybe not tiny. I don't think you can use Amazon and tiny in the same sentence anymore. But of the <laughs> whole marketing ecosystem, Amazon is just like a little slender. And we have to do that whole thing for everything else. Because, you know, I have plenty of clients that come to me and they're like, okay, well, you know, we have a ROAS of, of, of 1.7 on this $100,000 a month in spend. I'm like, okay, so tell me more about this. And they're like, so, like, what does it cost you to actually make the product? Well, our margins are 50%. I'm like, okay, so you're losing 20% on every sale. Like, that's what you're telling me, right? You're, you're losing money on every sale. They're like, yeah, but growth. I'm like, okay, but that's not sustainable unless you have like wild VC money. Like a tiger showed up and wrote you a check, cool. But right, and then at the very least, like they had a, a counter to you, right? They were like growth. And if that's truly what you care about, then great, go for it. And great, I'm happy for you. Yeah, but I customers. think that's, it's, it's, it's having that conversation and being exactly. really clear with the client like of what they actually want. And there was a, I think there was a question in here about, you know, how do you get them to actually think about this? And I think part of it is by asking some really direct questions and asking them like, okay, so I can spend, how much of every dollar can I spend? of your revenue can I spend on advertising and you still be profitable? And a lot of executives surprisingly haven't thought through that question, but pushing them to, to actually give you an answer, I think puts everybody in a situation to win. And that's like the more diplomatic way. The other diplomatic way to like get that stuff and to get some of those that answers back is like, okay, well, why should these other, why should you make these other partners share data with me? And why should I share with them? Well, because you've already paid them for it. Like, I don't want to waste your money. Like, let me have the SEO keyword research because at the end of the day, there's one SERP. So let me, let me see that. And let me see if that, if I can be helpful there. And I will share my PPC data with them so that they can see which keywords that they research that I'm, that maybe we don't rank for could be really, really profitable for them if they actually invested some time in. And let me talk to the social team so I can see what offers and what opportunities are there because then I can pull those into search ads and, and use them because they work. And I don't have to spend time and your money figuring that out when you've already done that. That's the diplomatic way, I think. The non-diplomatic way is what I did for one client, which is we had a they had a, an agency that refused to share data and they they were spending millions of dollars a month. And they didn't track any of it. They didn't put any pixels on the site. They didn't really do anything. So I just showed the executive, I was like, you spent $18 million in media last year. Here's your budget. And here's how much we know where it went. And it's like 2 million and there's $16 million here that you spent. And we have no idea what happened with it. And that inspired some reactions. Oh, good. At least there was a reaction. It, it wasn't positive. Yeah, I can imagine. But um, I think you have to be transparent about these things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's again to what Kirk was saying, it's longevity, right? So if you do right by the client and you help them ask the right questions, they will see you as a valuable business partner as opposed to someone who's yeah. there to make a quick buck. Yeah, I'm, I'm all about the, I'm, I'm really proud about our, our client retention. Our client retention has been like 95% for, for five years now, which is nice. unheard of. Like our longest clients, 13 years or 14 years now, which is but that's, I think you get there only by doing what Kurt said. If you don't do right by people, you're not going to get long-term customers. Hey, let's get tactical here for a minute. So uh, some folks on the Q&A are asking, what tools do you use to share data between PPC and SEO when it comes to uh, keywords that may be ranking? Sure. So, I mean, I use a few. Um, my favorite, like I love Search Console. Like I become obsessed with this like ridiculously little tool, but it's so much fun. Cause it's one of the few places where you can get like all of the query data, which I like. So I love putting, taking search data, search console data out. Um, I use, I used to use a lot more, but it's still good ans um, answer the public to do some keyword research on questions and start to come up with topical clusters. And then um, SEMrush, I guess, cause we're not calling it SEMrush anymore, even though that makes sense to my brain. Um, I love SEM Rush, SEM Rush. God. <laughs> like I said, you just did. Old habits die real hard. 
but yeah, I want as much data as possible. And Google has made, or Google ads, I should say, has made that very difficult to get all of your search yeah. terms data. Well, although Google ads made it much they easier. They did give back, they give back a little bit, but yeah, I'm just, geez. so now I, I like my search console data. And this is also a little bit the unknown and what Kirk was saying, you want to hedge your, not hedge your bets, that's not the words you use, but basically like you're going to have ups and downs in different channels. And a lot of these ups and downs are kind of driven by what Google is doing. So they just finished a core update, like literally in the middle of cyber week. And it's like, yeah, you know, this is the week we've all been preparing for. And now you're doing this. Um, and like literally two weeks before Black Friday, which we're all saving budgets for, shopping has a big bug and ends up spending all this budget. And now while your budget cap tools are basically saying, we can't spend anymore. And by the way, Google is going to refund you after Cyber Week, but who knows how much you're going to get refunded. So how, how do you know how much budget you have to spend? So there, there's all these crazy things constantly happening. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah that no, I don't think there's a solve for that one other than you know, I, I think you end up in this weird predicament where it's like you almost have to have like a twenty percent. For most of our clients, we average we we advise like seventy percent core, twenty percent test, ten percent when things hit the fan, just mm -hmm. like a slush fund, but like the positive connotation, not like the negative connotation. And if you're using that whole core, then all these things happen. Maybe you pull your testing budget or you pull that that slush fund in and just dump it in to try to mm -hmm. balance everything, but. Other than that, I mean, you're kind of in a rock and a hard place. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, what level um, Gabriel and his team are at, but, um, you know, taking that Google Search Console that Sam was talking about and then linking that to Google Ads. And then you do have in your predefined report section, you do have your paid and organic report. Mm -hmm. So you can see, you know, what's, you know, where you're showing for both paid and organic together on what terms. And, you know, kind of depending on where you're going to go with that and, and, and what you see there, you know, maybe it is worth testing, as Sam had said, maybe there are certain terms that you're going to want to test. Okay, well, what if we, what if, what if in a, a, a measured way, we, we did pull paid from these specific search terms that were real strong and organic, like what would happen? Um, and, you know, monitoring that, I'll, I'll note, a, I'll note a couple things on that, like the favorite well, like a couple of cautions, the favorite one for people to do that on is brand, right? People are always asking that like, oh, am I cannibalizing my brand traffic? Like be a little careful with, with that mindset because, um, you know, first of all, typically your brand CPCs because of your quality score versus your competitors, typically your brand CPCs are going to be really, really low. Not always. Um, your mileage may vary, but typically they are. So, like, and, and then kind of depending on what those SERPs actually look like, right? I, I mean, if, if you're going to, if you're going to pull, if you're going to pull brand from specific SERPs using exact match, let's say negative keywords, I mean, make sure that you're not actually still having some of your other match types <laughs> showing your brand in there. And so, um, so sometimes it's funny to me where someone will ask to be pulled from certain SERPs. And I'm like, okay, just so you know, if you do not want to show on brand, we need to like add that as a negative into a lot of your other keywords too. Otherwise, like broad match and stuff is going to take off close variance. You're going to be showing a brand again. So again, just make sure this is what you really want to do as a test. But, but make sure it actually is worth it and what you're going to gain by losing a, a few ad dollars you know, is, is, is worth it. Um, but you can do that for non-brand testing and that as well. So. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing with brand is that you have to think about the role of the channel, right. Or the role of the tactic. Like my analogy for brand is always insurance, right? This is not growth money. This is insurance money. So it's cheap, but at the end of the day, if somebody's searching for your brand, I would rather pay a small premium to make sure that my competition doesn't steal them because end of the day, they are pre-qualified and any smart competitor or competitor with like more than say 15 working brain cells is going to know that if they're searching, for instance, for Peloton, I have no interest in Peloton, right? But they're very qualified and very interested in the fitness bike. That seems good. I why, should why, exactly. Why risk it's losing 3% of those clicks to your competitors that you wouldn't need right. to because for all the ads are on top? Exactly. 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 
So, I mean, I look at it like, okay, this is just insurance. This is, I pay home insurance. I pay flood insurance. I pay all kinds of insurance. I pay business insurance. This is just business insurance to Google. Meh, I can live with that. Let me ask you a question since you brought up Peloton. Um, and oh, this goody. is something that's been bothering me. <laughs> what? I said, oh, goody, Peloton. Okay. Yeah, so why don't you use Peloton for so? No, this is not my question. Um, Whoa, <laughs> I feel attacked. You said I'm not in shape, Fred? Well, I don't know, but you said like, hmm, I don't do Peloton, so what do you do? That's true. <laughs> uh, run around the block sometimes? That's awesome. Like golf. Yeah, you don't need... I try to beat Aaron at golf, and I don't usually go... It doesn't usually go well. You're in great shape. You play basketball. You're probably your favorite than I am. I can shoot. Um, That's about it. But Peloton, okay, so... Peloton had a supply chain issue, and lots of companies are having supply chain issues, but they specifically had a period um, when they were just selling way more bikes than they could deliver. It was taking four months, and so people would place the order, and then they would cancel the order. And what I've always tried to figure out is, what do you do in terms of value adjustment, right? So you made the sale, but you couldn't deliver on the sale. Do you restate that to Google, and you say, well, actually, that wasn't? ROAS, positive return, that, that didn't lead to profit. But at the same time, that's risky because that customer didn't follow through on the order because something that was broken with your business as opposed to them changing their mind and returning the bike. So I'm just curious to hear your broader thoughts on supply chain issues. What do you do if you don't have the product? Do you substitute something else in? Do you pause the budgets? How do you report value to Google? Like what do you do to not break things for when they work again? I see a huge difference between, and like, I, I try to hit this hard as I'm talking with people, like we are marketers and our goal in marketing is not to verify and follow that sale through the end. Like that's just, that's, that's not our goal. Our goal is to identify and find the right audience, show them the right message and, and get them to purchase. That doesn't mean that stuff you said isn't important. I just think it's really important to qualify that. So in that sense, like, I, I actually fall into the camp of not thinking that we should try to somehow go back and figure out how to exclude whatever, because for whatever reason, like we did our job well and they did want to purchase. Now, all of the other stuff that happened in the meantime, supply chain, the, the client customer service sucks and they like curse them out. So the, the customer said, fine, I'm leaving, right? All that stuff. That's not, that's not a marketing thing. So to me, I see that as a responsibility on the client side to have their numbers down so that they figure out here is what we should expect, here's what needs to change, and then communicate that to us in terms of a goal adjustment that we're aiming at. And so like, hey, our, you know, whatever, however you want, ROAS, POAS, all that stuff, like in some ways, like, I don't care, like help us know how should we be adjusting our strategy and the algorithms and all that and our reporting and all that, what are we aiming at? And if you're telling me, hey, like our, our prophecy decrease, we literally had a client do this, like, because of all the stuff, their margins just have decreased. And so they communicated to us new goals, new adjustments. I think that's how I see what you described needing to happen. Not that we f try to figure out some complex, hey, we need to go in there and now remove those people who, had, who wanted to purchase in the beginning and didn't and that sort of thing. Because in some ways, like they were a good audience. They were who we were trying to target. So that's, that's how I fall in that. Yeah, I... It's all somewhere similar, I think. So I think there is a material difference between a supply chain, a supply chain issue and like a rapid return or like a, a scammy transaction. Scammy transactions, absolutely. We like, we Agreed. will remove those and we will push that back into Google and say, this, this wasn't legit because it wasn't legit. It's Same the wrong like audience. Non, right, exactly. But this was the right audience. And I think that's where this integration really comes even more into focus because like, I want to be able to go like, okay, well, what was confusing to this person that made them now want their money back because they wanted the bike. Were we not clear enough that it's a four month back order? Did our email marketing campaigns not properly convey where we are in the supply chain? Did something else just infuriate them? Like what, what's the reason they now want their money back? They wanted the product, now they don't, why? Nothing has changed in my mind on our end. So I think this is where that having those really open relationships so that I can go and say, hey guys, paid search drove 45 bike sales over the past month that have refund esque for a refund due to shipping delays. Are we not properly communicating to these people that 
the bikes are now four months out and you know what's the gap here because in my mind if you're up front with somebody at the moment of purchase and say hey just so you know and like there's a store that um who did i just buy from oh mori the the baby company i have a new kid so i'm like buying baby clothes like a crazy person right mm-hmm. like kurt's over here like laughing at me but like they were like hey this isn't gonna ship for like seven weeks i'm like i don't give a shit it's fantastic i want it but they were very upfront with me and I still bought it and I'm not going to cancel it because the expectation was set that I'll get it in seven weeks, which in my mind is like 10 weeks. So cool. So I think this is where having those open conversations really makes a lot of sense. And to Kurt's point, yeah, you don't want to tell Google or Facebook or, or, or TikTok or YouTube, like, Hey, these weren't good people because they were good people and they weren't, they were a relevant audience. So yeah, I think you have to, you have to have that conversation with the client. Yeah, they no. shouldn't be removed from the bidding algorithms, basically. No. Like they they were who we wanted to go after. Right. And they and, and they purchased. They did the thing. You just screwed up the app the back end. So we need to figure out how do you don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Hey Kirk, you got five kids. Uh, any advice there for Sam on his first kid uh, buying clothes seven weeks out for a baby? Don't they double in size like every two weeks? Not to correct you, but six kids. <laughs> that's okay that's okay that you forgot i'm not offended um i know people i have friends who are like i'm so sorry i I never remember your kids names i'm like i don't remember my kids names like you don't have to apologize to me um (laughs) yeah no i have i have no advice i don't know what i'm doing you won't know what you're doing it's okay like that's that's literally parenting right there yeah figure it out read books perfect yeah Yeah. (laughs) i want to time for that (laughs) <laughs> Seriously, right? Uh, last question here from the audience, and then I'll let you guys um, share anything that you feel like we may have missed. Uh, but experience with Pmax campaigns, and so Pmax, it seems to drive good results for a number of advertisers, but it is also very low on uh, the kinds of controls that you have. So when we're talking about upper funnel, lower funnel, brand, non-brand, remarketing, like all of these things that should be on or off in various situations, um, do you even recommend Pmax if you use Pmax? Any advice? Are you guys testing it? Uh, we're testing it. It's been an adventure. I feel like it's like a roller coaster of emotions. It's like a reality TV show. Like there was like minutes where you look at it, like it's beautiful. But I think you have to. It's been really difficult for us to not have any, like virtually no controls, right? It's like running on everything. It's pulling creative in. I'm like, mm. honestly, I think it's a good idea. It kind of was like smart shopping, but like, smart shopping and smart search like jammed together in like a weird Frankenstein's monster situation. Huh. I mean, for well, some kind of, it's great. The thing it's that confuses just, me the most is advertisers revolt the most when Google combines channels. When they, by default, yeah. opt you into display when you do search. Uh, no, thanks. Um, smart shopping, the biggest complaint is that we don't, we can't distinguish between what are your remarketing results and what are your results from other channels, right? And here, this is great for newbie advertisers who have no way to get into all of the channels you now should be on. But for us professionals who actually care to optimize it, it's like, boom, here's everything. Literally every channel that Google has, all eight of them or something, or seven, please correct me on my numbers. Um, <laughs> But uh, right, and then you get everything, which is great. It's easy, but you no know, controls. Um, and, and then also to the point of like, is there incrementality or are the results mostly being driven by the easy channels that are cannibalizing your SEO efforts, your content marketing efforts? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have, so so we're not, we're not really testing performance max. We're like basically starting to say, okay, like which accounts, like, like you said, Fred, we're trying to think through it and not just, well, let's try it and see, especially since I know it cannibalizes like everything. And sometimes I, I don't mind not being an early adopter until like other people, you know, like Ricard. So thank you have, have seen it and figured it out and they can tell us. Um, so I, I think there's kind of some benefit in that. I will speak maybe a little bit with some smart shopping thoughts because again, I think it's similar in focus other, other, other than like adding more channels in. Um, and like, here's here's what I've found with smart shopping. I like, there are parts of it that I really like and then parts of it that I dislike. And I imagine it would be the same thing with Performance Max. Um, 
And that is like, I, I have, I admit, I've started to shift in my thinking of audience versus channel focused. And, and what I mean by that is like, like we have seen the idea that Google can take this individual and all, and all the data they have on this individual that like, I just don't have access to their recent search history, like, like basically them being, but them being in the market more than this person that I just, I just maybe don't have that at, at auction time. And they can then therefore take and show them a shopping ad on display or YouTube for a fraction of the CPCs that I'm, I'm trying to hash out with search. Um, and therefore, like, I think that's part of why also, you know, shooting more, bottom funnel too. I think that's part of why smart shopping tends to perform better that we see than just specifically search um, because they are a little bit more focused on this person and wherever they are on the web, regardless of the auction price. And in some ways, I think they just get a win because they can find that person and get cheaper auctions, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. One of the struggles I have, and this is coming right off of Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend, is like when you Part of the problem with having something incredibly automated is like when for whatever reason you have something that isn't part of the way their algorithms are thinking, but you know as the marketer and you, you need to maybe make more adjustments or just... So a lot of times what's happened for us in the past on Black Friday, Cyber Monday, when we have you know more manually controlled is we are able just to like like move the needle forward if, if you know a client's requesting, hey, let's get some more traffic, things like that. I've just found smart shopping to be really tough to control in terms of like, we don't just want you to target this row as that you've had targeted. Like we want you to go ahead and actually push this and it just doesn't want to take off. Even if we're like increasing the budget, lowering the target row as that sort of thing. Right. And, and so I think there can be a, a little bit of a struggle there with fully automated that I imagine would be the struggle with performance max too, where if we do look ahead in a world where things are just fully automated and, and we saw that like over all of our accounts, like smart shopping did not do as well over this last BFCM weekend as our standard shopping did um, in terms of like our efficiency in that um, brought in more volume. So, so anyways, that's just, just some of that thought would be that overly automated thing just seems to continue to work for us at least well, overall when things are fairly stable when you do have these these crazy these crazy spikes and that it still seems a struggle for us I'm, I'm actually curious to hear from others if they see similar or different things but that's what that's what i think interesting yeah. i think i mean part of the challenge with with performance max and with any of the automated campaigns is that when you automate everything you basically push the advertiser control up to the data layer, right? Because at the end of the day, the only thing you can then really control as an advertiser is the input going into, into Performance Max. So your, your feed, your audience definitions, uh, your business data feed, your, your, your GMC, your, your first party audiences, your remarketing tags, your customer lists, et cetera. And if those things aren't actually synced up and working, or if you haven't invested in building that infrastructure, you're just basically giving Google a very large check and saying, mm. and that tends to be a, a recipe for, for sadness. Maybe a little, little sprinkle of regret on top. And on that happy note, um, I want to thank, thank both of you for, uh, for being on the show today. Um, yes. Tell folks quickly uh, what you want them to do. So Kirk, I bet you want them to uh, subscribe to your new podcast. What else should they do to uh, find you? Yeah, you can connect with me, PPC Kirk, on all of the social channels. Yeah, hit hit us up. Uh, check out our podcast. Um, we're trying to do some good things there. So nice, and thank you as always for being on the show, Sam. What about you? How do uh, people find so, you? So um, I'm Digital Sam. I am on all the channels, but the ones I LinkedIn and Twitter are probably the two biggest ones. So connect me there. Um, if you have more questions, email is sam at warshofsky.com. I'm pretty easy. Awesome. Well, great. Uh, it's been a great session. Uh, great questions from the audience. If people like this, please subscribe, and you'll be notified about uh, the next session that we have. We'll probably try to put together one more for uh, later in December here, and then have uh, a whole new set for 2022. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you for the next one.
Thanks. Thanks.